But, um, you know, I, I've done all of this, and the one thing that was unique about America True was that we did outreach, and that was way back in 1995. And the way we did it was a little bit of strong arming because people wanted us, wanted me to come to their clubs and go and do speeches. And I said, okay, as long as you do something we call True Youth. And they're like, what is this? I'm like, you have boats. There's people in your community that have never been on boats. We're gonna bring them together. We're gonna do a one day event where you take them sailing and you talk about finding your passion. It's not about sailing, it's about finding your passion and trying new things. So when we started doing that, I'll be honest, there were clubs like, what? You're gonna have poor little kids come? You're gonna show poor little kids the wealthiness? I'm like, I'm not wealthy. We're gonna show them the reality of what sailing is. And it was a phenomenal like breakthrough. The beginning was, I don't know, what about this? What's the liability? What happens if they drowned? You know, they throw up on their shoes. I'm like, yay, that's fun. And then, but then by the end of every single one of those days that we did, there was this bonding. And I met somebody here t uh, yesterday from Annapolis. The Box of Rain program was evolved out of the America True, True Youth program. So it's just getting that going. So anyway, that's, that's my pitch. But one thing that we're doing now at the total other end is Oak Cliff Sailing Center. And we're a nonprofit sailing center that is open to everybody who sails. We're not a learn to sail, but we're there because of the success of junior sailing programs and community boating programs, because those generally focus on the kids and we're the repository for where they can go to continue their education and continue their sailing. And this is a model that people can take bits and pieces of and use in your own programs. The thing that's unique about Oak Cliff is that we have 76 boats. We're located 45 minutes outside of Manhattan, so we have a huge group to pull from. Our sea breeze comes in after work, so we're an after work activity. And we have the luxury of being able to create new programming. So you've heard all this stuff about get rid of windward lures, do pursuit racing, do different stuff. We do that every week, Tuesday night, match racing drills, coaching drills, umpiring. Wednesday night, fleet racing with coaches on the water in boats, coaching in power boats next to the sailboats as they're racing. We made the rules okay to have outside assistance while racing. And then Thursday nights are pursuit races. So why am I talking about this? Having coaching in all levels of your programming, even if it's just you coaching you, and then the next night you flip it over, creates diversity like you read about. We were racing my first race, Lottie, who's from Nigeria, was sailing, and he goes, hey boss, this is the most black people I've ever sailed with. There's two. And I was like, Lottie, you wait till tomorrow because John Passmore is coming. We're going to have three. But it's natural. It's unusual for us not to have 25 to 50% women on any team. And I'm talking all the way up to grade two match racing events. Why? Because there's coaching and there's this idea of that we're all learning. We don't worry about winning. We learn about getting better. So, um, and then the final just little bit once you get through that, like I've introduced, I've gone community boating, I've been racing, I've been coaching, I've coached, and I want to make this my life. That's where Oak Cliff is completely unique. So we have an egg corn and sapling program, and there's a couple of sap grads here uh, this week, and they receive training. It's a full-time residential program that they learn match racing, fleet racing, inshore, offshore, every part of boat maintenance, Sail making, you break the sail, you fix it. You break the boat, you fix it. You run the boat out of engine, you gotta rebuild an, out of oil, you gotta rebuild an engine. So they learn all of that. Plus we talk about PR, marketing, legal, and also overall the whole thing, what is the right thing to do? If you're going to be a professional in the sport, you better be honored and call yourself a professional in every good part of the word. It doesn't matter whether you're getting paid or not, it's how you carry yourself. So that's, that's the most important thing about Oak Cliff. Let's just jump back into what we're talking about today is the diversity. I just pulled these off the internet and you look at the numbers, you know, 309 million American, 157 million women, 85 million non-white, 8 million LG, oh, 
VTB, that's not supposed to be. Um, anyway, and these are all areas that sailing has traditionally ignored, but they haven't completely ignored sailing. But that is basically, out of all of that, there's 1.4 million sailboats on the water and only 41,000 are members of US sailing. So there's a huge marketing opportunity for everybody here who's representing a yacht club and wants to have more members, everybody who's representing a boat brokerage and wants to sell more boats, anybody who wants to get a job coaching more people, there's a huge opportunity. We just need to look at it. And so a few things before I hand it over that I've seen in my travels around the world a few times that you might be able to consider using. In New Zealand, how many people have an opening day at their yacht club? You know, everybody, yeah. So, and it's different around the country. Some places it's a big party, and other places it's blue blazers and it's exclusive and you know the ladies with big hats and all that kind of stuff. But in New Zealand, opening day means they coordinate it. Every yacht club in the country is open to the public. And you can go on a tour of yacht clubs and have hot dogs and go for a sale. And it's an amazing marketing and opportunity that will break down barriers. So consider working within your YRA to make opening day. Maybe you still want to have the blue blazer stuff, fine, if that's what your club wants, but consider having an open opening day where every club is opening their doors to the public and invite people. The other thing is if you're going to do that and if you're going to tell people that you think sailing's elitist but it's not, you need to tell them about a hundred times. You can't just casually say to somebody at the office, hey, why don't you come sailing with me sometime? Whew, it goes right out. I did speeches about Oak Cliff in the beginning, and I said, we are a place for sailors. At that point, we only had adult programming. Like, we're a place for adult programming. I would speak for an hour telling them, come, sail with us. And every time, in the question and answer, I would get one of the first questions, this sounds like a great program. Do you have anything for adults? Anything for me? I'm like, I just spoke for an hour. So you have to say over and over, I want you, I want you. That is outreach. It's one person at a time. The other thing is, um, we're talking about diversity. And I love this picture. And I wrote, this is a real photo. I mean, these crazy people. This is a place we've done down in um, Hunter's Point in San Francisco. It's a India Basin, it's right below the projects, and we started t 11 years ago doing sailing and kayaking and Hobie Cats, and some years we have a whale boat, sometimes we have a Catalina 35, but every single year we do a picnic and an introduction to the water, and we have had that grow over and over. I've seen kids that were like babies in a kayak now are in school, and they're, they're like, I know what I'm going to be. I know what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a jellyfish fisherman. <laughs> I'm like, yay, we've blown out the possibilities of what you can do with your life. You can do anything. So, and these people came off the water, and they just impromptu jumped up. I'm like, oh, that's a marketing picture. We've got to use that. But it's just more fun when you have different people thinking about different ideas from different perspectives, and you can laugh with each other. Okay, so I've already talked about Oak Cliff and the coaching really, really, really increases the opportunity for, it breaks down the barriers, it makes it easier. It's like, come sail with me, along with me, we're in this together, as opposed to, you too can buy a boat and go sailing. That's scary to somebody who hasn't been there. And then the final point is diversity in your leadership of your yacht club, of your program, of your organization is super critical. Obviously, I've sailed a lot. This is my world, right? Personal experience. I was out in Color or Utah with the Coaches Association, who were almost all men, College Coaches Association. I'm older than them. I'm more experienced than most of them. Being the only female, I still felt like I didn't belong. And I had to give my head a shake. I had to talk to myself, like, this is not, this is not possible. Stand up, you're fine. <laughs> But I had to have that conversation inside my head, which is ridiculous. You need to have people that I look like and you look like in leadership or you will not achieve diversity. No matter how much you know, those people want to help, if you don't have that diversity in the leadership, it's not going to work. And then the final thing is, and there's a big push for this, is equal means equal. Do you guys remember back with the Olympics when the England was in and all, there was this, 
Before it used to be all the medals were open. That meant any 300 pound, six foot tall woman could sail the fin because it was open. No, it's not. We know what dinghies are like. So Anita de France was on the IOC board and I literally called her and said, I know that the, the meeting in China said that, you're, you know, the, you're, the IOC said you need to have equality, you need to have equality in leadership and you need to have, you know, equality across the medals. I said, but what is equal? She's like, equals equal. I was like, no, but what number is equal? She's like, Dawn, 50% is equal. I was like, oh, crap, you're right. You know, so it was, you need to start to look towards that, and that is an achievable goal across the board when you're talking gender. Um, there's more women than men. There's more women in sailing. Let's push for a realistic goal, which is to have equal representation on the boats. And one way that the people at Block Island Race Week are talking about, they came to me and a few other people, Steph Robel in Key West, and they're like, we're thinking about having an all women's class. I'm like, no, that's segregation. I said, how about you give trophies in whichever class for the teams that have at least 50% women on board? Recognize that, celebrate, look forward. Don't do token, don't do segregation, recognize that if we have a team that's at least 50% women and they're doing well, yay. So that's something that I think you're gonna see more and more because I've heard at least four or five other organizations in the past month start to talk about it. So anyway, that, those, are, those are my um, topics. And now, does anybody have any questions really quick on any of that? Okay, good. So now let me introduce Jason. I'm gonna let you talk about yourself. I'm so happy that you were able to come to USAL, and you said how many, 43 different NGBs? 47. 47 NGBs, and we're on the beginning of the list. So there you go. Well, good morning, my name's Jason Thompson. I am the Director for Diversity and Inclusion at the United States Olympic Committee. Uh, I've been doing, I was actually the first, so they hired me to start the program, so we're trying to get all our NGBs on this idea of diversity and inclusion, why it's important, and all those kind of things. But uh, I'm gonna tell you a story, actually, about something that's somewhat connected. Years ago, I've done diversity for almost 20 years now, which keeps you young, that's why I look like this, diversity keeps you young. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I sold uh, financial services. And uh, I remember I went to my boss one day, and you know, I said, you know, I need better sales techniques or whatever, and, and he says, well, you know, the best salesman I've seen is the homeless guy down on the corner. And I said, why is that? And he said, because every person that walks by, he puts his cup out and asks for change. And uh, needs to say, I failed miserably at financial services because not everybody's a qualified lead. So that's something you have to know, that don't build your business around what a homeless guy does. You'll not have success. But with diversity, many times you, felt, you feel overwhelmed. And I felt overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. And many times when, we, when I work with sports organizations or healthcare organizations or business in general, they don't know where to start. We know we need to do something in the area of diversity, but what do we do? And what you do is you need to know who is a qualified lead, because technically not everybody is someone who you need to approach. And I'll explain that as we go through this. This is just some data about percentages, and, and this is means, and the reason I put this up is because essentially these are qualified leads, right? We know that the LGBT community has money. We know that Asian Americans have money. We know that the Latino buying power is increasing significantly in the United States. Um, we also know that more and more children are, of color are being born annually. In fact, I think 2012 was the first year in which more minority children were born than white children in the United States. So this demographic is growing. So how do we approach this demographic? It's growing, what do we do about it? Where are my qualified leads? And um, as I work through this, hopefully what you'll start to see is this is actually not as complicated when you start putting the pieces together. So I have just a few very simple slides. What this is, is several universities got together and they figured out, hey, where's the growth gonna come from? And what they found is between the year 2007 and the year 2018, um, where are we gonna see the growth? So when you read this, this isn't to say that only 4% of the students are gonna be white. What it's saying is that if we look at this demographic of people we can recruit to universities, where we see our growth is 4% of that growth will be white students. 26% of that growth will be students who are black. 29% will be Asian students. 32% will be American Indian. 38% will be Hispanic, okay? So that's where they're gonna see the growth. Why is this important to you? Well, the one reason it's important to you is because if I go to college, I become middle class. If I'm middle class, I have disposable income. If I have disposable income, I buy a boat, right? Mm -hmm. They're qualified leads. So this is essentially the funnel for USA sale. 
right? And I'm not saying don't go into the inner city, don't do work there. The reason most people have a lot of frustration with their diversity and inclusion is that they're in the wrong place or they don't understand the long-term outcome of it. For example, if you do work in the inner city, it's gonna take a lot of work before that child can buy a boat. So you'll probably be frustrated because you'll be thinking, well, you know what, we've done all this work and we're still not seeing the diversity we hope to see. And I'm not saying don't go into inner city, I'm saying if you go to the inner city, know what you're gonna get. Know how that process works. The good news is universities are doing part of the work for you because many universities have programs so that st kids stay in school that they graduate from college. So they're doing the work for you. So that's why I say you need to know who are your qualified leads, where is that low hanging fruit? So where would I start? If I was USA Sailing, where would I start? At the university level because you have a huge challenge here. One of the major challenges with this demographic is they don't know how to swim. If they don't know how to swim, they're never getting on a boat, guaranteed. 60% of African Americans cannot swim, all right? But it's your funnel, right? This is the funnel that we see how it's expanding. These are the potential qualified leads for the work that you're gonna do. And if that potential is saying, we don't know how to swim, you got a huge challenge. So some of your work fundamentally needs to be at how are you getting people and teaching them how to swim. One of the, some of the low-hanging fruit right now is USA Swimming has a swim program targeted towards minority communities. So I would be supporting that effort if I were you because it's, they're already doing the work. So you can support what USA Swimming does. It's called Make a Splash Program to teach minorities how to swim, right? So some of the work's already being done. I'd be supporting that effort because if you can swim, you can get on a boat, right? So that's a lot of times we get overwhelmed because we're making it too complicated, right? This is a low-hanging fruit at the university level because we know once you go to college, you typically become middle class. That is your demographic, right? Middle class, that's who you want. And many times, again, USA uh, skiing, snowboard came to me, same thing, like, hey, we've done this work. And I said, you know, let's be honest about your demographic and how you do work. You're not even trying to approach every single white person, right? There's only certain people who are gonna do skiing. L you need to be honest about who's your demographic and you need to know who that target is. And it's not to say don't, you know, don't approach people who are low income or whatever, but you should know when you go there, what are you gonna get from that? You know, what's your intention? How much, how much money do you have to invest in it? What that pipeline looks like, short term, long term? And you probably should be doing some things <coughs> just because it's the right thing to do. But you gotta do some things because I'm trying to grow my sport and we need to have some quick turnaround. I'm telling you right now, that's where the quick turnaround is. Universities do all kind of outreach programs to get those children into school, get them into the middle class. Once they're in the middle class, it makes it a lot easier for you to do the work that you're gonna do. So that's what I would encourage you to do, to understand those programs, connect those dots. Now there's another thing you need to think about too with sport, and that's this one. And I apologize, I don't know if everybody can see this, but what this is, and it's an interesting question. What I, what I, the question is, how do you get the job of driving this truck? Does anybody know how you get the job of driving that truck? For those who can't see, it's a monster truck. How many of us have been to a monster truck event? Raise your hand. Really? Okay. How many of you have never <laughs> been to a monster truck event? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, let's be honest, why don't you go to monster truck events? It's noisy, what's another reason we don't go? Thank you, who said that? It's, it's, okay, yeah, I know. Exactly. Okay, so that's why I don't go, right? Rednecks, white folks, they don't like black people, I ain't going, okay? It's, it's, the math on that is real simple. Okay, now, but I've never been to a monster truck event, how do I know that's true? Because I bought the stereotype, didn't I? We all have biases, and it's so much easier when we do diversity work when I can blame the world. Everybody else is racist, I'm gonna go fix them. The issue is Jason doesn't know anything about monster truck, but I'm comfortable with that bias, aren't I? Matter of fact, my friends believe it too. This is my daughter in front of the truck. And so we were there at that event. I looked at my wife and said, we ain't going to that event. And she said, no, we're not. And neither one of us looked and said, hey, that's completely racist. We don't know anything about those white folks going there, but we assume they don't like me. How do we know that? We don't, right? We just bought that stereotype and we just run with it. And so the reason you don't know how to buy to get the keys for that truck is because you have this bias. Well, the, what I'm telling you is I have the same bias about sailing. The only difference is I'm assuming it's rich white people. They don't like me, I don't like them, they don't want black folks, I ain't going. <laughs> How do I know that? I don't, it's a stereotype, right? So part of our work has to be, okay, what are the stereotypes and what are we doing to break down those stereotypes, right? What is the work we're doing? And you know, one of the huge challenges that we see many times is that people feel attacked. For instance, this morning I've been to several panels and I've been amazed at how many panels are just full of white men, no women, and they all seem to have gray hair. Now, is that a bad thing? 
Not necessarily. The, the real issue is what does the pipeline look like, right? Because they've earned it. I'm not saying we should take anything away from those guys. They earned it. The real issue is if you have a pipeline and you're trying to grow your sport and the people behind them also look like gray-haired white guys, you're not going to have any growth in your sport and you're gonna, th the sport is dying. That's what you can learn from that. The sport is dying. And so the real issue is not who do we attack and who do we point the finger is, is what's our strategy? You know, how do we get more women involved? And, you know, and I work with several different you know, governing organizations, you know, USA Basketball, USA Swimming. You know, in USA Basketball, they come to me and they say, Jason, you know, I, I don't know what we're going to do in this diversity thing. You know, we feel we're pretty diverse. We, we got this thing covered, Jason. And I said, great. Um, how many women in coaching do you have? Complete silence. I mean, I love women's basketball. So if you saw the NC2A championships this year, the two teams that played for it, both head coaches were male. Since Title IX, although we've seen an increase in the number of women on the court, we've seen a de decrease in the number of women coaching. There's a huge challenge there that USA Basketball needs to start dealing with. Women should not be dropping out of basketball when it comes to coaching. So being on the court is only half the battle. And so that's the thing you need to start thinking about too. What's our leadership look like? What's our athletes look like? And this is actually a good example of one of the things that you can do. And NASCAR and monster trucks have figured out something that you don't gotta buy the truck to be a fan. And so when you think about how you grow your sport, you should also be thinking about, do you have to own the boat to be a fan? Do I have to even know how to sail to be a fan? Think about it. The majority of people who go to monster truck will never drive the truck. They don't know how to get the keys. If you go to NASCAR, you, you probably, matter of fact, if you go to NASCAR, the average fan couldn't even buy the tires that go on that car. <laughs> think about it, right? But the, the stadium is packed. So when you think about diversity, it doesn't have to be that I have to be able to sail. It's how do you make the sport tangible for me to participate. There's a lot of places I could be a fan of, of sailing, but what have you done to try to grow that part of it, right? Even if I never learned to swim, I could still be a fan. And I thought what was interesting is I went to, I've been going to several of the different sessions. One of the sessions I went to, which I thought was very interesting, was the first one was the opening and um, was America's Cup. They had this kind of cool highlight video of America's Cup. I like sports. I couldn't actually understand the video, and it was a highlight video, and I thought, you had to know some context about USA Selling to understand that video. And I thought if you have a highlight video that the average Joe like me who actually likes sports can't understand, you're gonna struggle. You can't grow your sport. It should be very tangible. And there's some, because what happened was in that video I realized you had to understand the race and there was a comeback or something. And I was like, I, you know, I don't get it. It, it seemed really exciting, but it, it was only exciting if you knew the context. And that's why it's so important to have diversity of thought also. If you have a board and everybody on your board has come through sailing, you should not be surprised why you haven't had any growth because you're not even allowing a diversity of thought. Somebody should be able to stand. And matter of fact, the, the good thing that I did see was when they were saying when, the, when they were doing the announcing, they had a guy from ESPN or whatever who had no background in sailing. Mm -hmm. And he said the sailing people didn't like it, but the people who didn't loved it. That's how you're going to grow your sport. You got to have that guy there because he's explaining it to people like me who don't know it. So you got to make your sport tangible. And some of the wins that I've seen is, I don't know if you know, but tennis has changed their sport. So when you go to tennis, they've turned the court, so they double the size of people who can participate. They created a bigger ball because they found that kids who have early success will stay in the sport. That if they got there and they're playing on this huge court and you're seven, you can't get the ball to the net, you ain't coming back. So by shortening this, the, the court, they made it easier for you to have success and they found the kids stay in it. Rugby seven is gonna be in the Olympics I don't know if you've ever seen Rugby Sevens. They basically simplified rugby, seven on seven. I don't know what it was before. I've seen it on TV a couple times. <laughs> it is so much fun to watch. And they do the same thing. Like, of course, now it's like, you know, you gotta be at, at like midnight to see the, the tournaments. But they're, they're really cool though, actually. And if you like football, I would really encourage you to watch because it's actually really cool. Very tangible. But they, they simplified the sport. Fewer players, more points. I think they play 15 minute halves. Um, anybody who has even an inkling of what football looks like can understand it right away. And so it's seen exponential growth, and NFL is actually investing in rust rugby sevens now, because they clearly see that that sport's gonna grow. So that's another question you need to be asking yourself. A as I've been sitting through all the sessions, I've been writing down all these words that I I've never heard before. Like this morning, there's a huge session on keels, I think, the keels <laughs> I, And I really had no clue what that meant. So if you're not making your sport more tangible, how do I access it? How do I get the keys? And that's the question you should be asking yourself, regardless of race. You know, there are a lot of white people who are middle class who can't participate because you've not opened the door to them. And you'll continue to struggle until you figure out a way to give people the keys. Several years ago, some friends of mine invited us out to their boat, and this was in Oklahoma, where actually there's a lot of water in Oklahoma. And uh, 
they pulled my son in some kind of rope thing, and he's in this, you know, the tube or whatever, bouncing around. We had a great time, and I thought, man, I should buy a boat. As soon as I got home, I wanted to do that. And then I thought, what am I thinking? I don't know the first thing about a boat. I don't even know who to call to learn anything about boating. I didn't know how to get the keys. So if you leave with nothing else from this presentation, you should understand that for the average Joe who's like Jason, you've got to show them where are the keys. How do I get on the boat? And one of the challenges is going to be you've got to know how to swim. Luckily, I do know how to swim, but many people don't know how to swim. So you've got to do some work in the swimming area and show them how to get the keys. So with that, Lou, you're the man now. Uh, I'm sorry, unless somebody has questions. I don't know if anybody has any questions right now. This is fascinating. I had one very specific question. Yes. Uh, We are three days down east of all white. You know, <laughs> there is zero diversity. And, you know, we're trying to outreach to the community. How would we go about making ourselves known and somehow bringing people of diversity, whether it's LGBT or the Asian, Latino, black, how can you bring people in? to a community, have you had any experience with that? Yeah, and actually, this is the easiest thing to do, but people make this way too complicated. For example, diversity is very broad, right? So on that continuum, you have race, you have gender, you have LGBT. So the question should be, on, in this area that's all white, then the focus is probably better energy on what can we do in the area of gender? And I guarantee there are some LGBT people in your community. And that's probably the best place to focus your energy. Because let's be honest, if you have to go four hours to even get to you, I probably ain't coming. And it's not that it's a bad place, but you know, think about your weekend. Do you want to spend your weekend four hours on the road before I even get to the sailor? And I've just learned this sport? Probably not. So it's probably not the best use of your energy. Diversity is very broad. And there are a lot of things you can do is look at your board and say, you know, how diverse is our board? It's all just people who come through sailing. That's why it's not growing, because everybody who's on our board knows sailing the same way I do. We can do some diversity just in the diversity of thought. How do we invite people who just know nothing about sailing so that we can hear a different perspective? Or we put a video together, they can say, you know what, I, I don't get it. It looks exciting, but I don't get it. Th you have to have that voice. And so I would really put your energy on, what is the diversity that's accessible to me? And it, almost in every category, you can do something with gender. Almost guaranteed. I, I, just, I just wanted to add something to that, because this kind of gets overlooked in diversity. It's also diversity of ability. Yes. And yeah. my focus of my own project is on blind sailing and really adaptive sailing. So, I'm sure there's people in the community that are, have some disability, whether they're children or adults, bring them in. Yeah, well said, well said. And I think we forget about that a lot of times with the building. And uh, another thing we, we forget too is we'll always say, well, you know what, we, our, our doors are, are wider, but then you set up the tables and I can't get through in my chair. I actually was at an event in which we were hosting, it was my event, I was attending, we were hosting a wheelchair basketball team and they couldn't get to the stage. So they had to sit in the back of the room no one had even thought about that. So ability is one of the things we often overlook. And, it's, and if you think about it, with all the wars that we've had, there are a lot of young men and women who come back and they deserve better. We can do better and we should create access and make sure they have access. Do you have a question? Um, the other issue that we've run into is uh, transportation. Um, can you start over coming over, like staying over that hurdle of like, socioeconomic barriers and that's like, lines and across geographic lines, you've got a single mom who works, she's not taking off to get her kids to practice with weight loss. Um, do you have any, <coughs> can you speak to that at all, solutions that you found? One of the things, <coughs> excuse me, transportation is always an issue, parents' time is always an issue. There's a couple things that are on your side. One is, sometimes you have to just create some partnerships. A lot of times the church has a bus. So maybe you do a partnership with the, with, with the church so you can get access to the bus or there's a community center that has a bus or a senior center or whatever, because transportation is always an issue. But there's some data that most people aren't real, that may not be aware of. Uh, I believe it was, um, uh, what was it, karate or somebody. <coughs> anyway, they, they did a study. And what they found is that if a child is in a sport, regardless of their parents' income, they will continue to take their child regardless of cost. That, it's, that they have to have success, though. So if the child is having success, and you have a monthly fee for this karate class, what they found is those parents don't drop out even if they can't afford it, the parents will find a way. So the most important thing is to do what tennis did, right? They simplified the sport so that a kid would have success early. So that's what I would encourage you to do. They found that uh, money was not a barrier if the child was successful, that parents, and if you think about it, I do the same thing with my kids. There are a lot of times when 
my daughter plays volleyball, and I looked at the price, like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Because I love her about, I don't know, $1,000? It's typically like $2,000. But for whatever reason, we find the money, and we pay for it. So again, parents will find the money. It's one of the, the biggest myths, that parents will struggle to find ways to get their kids if the kid is having success. Other than the fact that we had four people in wheelchairs, two blind, three deaf, a young man with cerebral palsy, and a woman whose left side was uh, affected by a stroke, the culture was that everybody did everything to the best of their ability, and there was none of this sit in the back. I could be hauling on a halyard to raise the mains with a Lachlan behind me in his wheelchair, deaf, hauling with one arm, which is all that he could do but he was hauling as hard as he could. And I think we have to, what, what I like to say is, take the word respect apart. It means to look again and find the abilities and then share them. Well said. So, yeah, so thank you for that awesome. Thank you so much. So we've talked about the, the outreach, and we have people here that are doing like, take the sailing to them. That's why America True worked, because we took it to where the projects were, and we put kayaks in. We said, forget about high performance skips. Let's just do kayaks and get them in the water. So that's one thing. So we've talked about the outreach, the, the community, the, the different uh, organizations, and now we're gonna have Lou come, who is from Chicago. He's gonna introduce himself, but he's a boat broker. A good friend of mine works for him and said he's the best boss ever. So Lou, come on up. Don and I, first I want to I want to commend Don because she touched on one thing that I think is important that any type of diversity initiative has to have and in the sport we have to do more of and that's mentoring I think one of the things that spoke out to me about your your points so that you talked about Oak Cliff is that they mentor people and that's ultimately when you're bringing a diverse audience to the group you have to mentor them what's you know how do you behave in a yacht club how do you I mean I when, when I brought, I brought kids to a yacht club and you know it's like all right guys this is what it is they see the trophies they're like wow I've never I've never seen this what is that made out of, you know? So, you know, so it, it's just, a, it's, it's a process for them, you know? It, but it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing to see, the, to see the world through the eyes of a child like that. It's, it's, it's something else. Um, I, I, I'm gonna dovetail off of a point that, uh, that Jason made, and that's the point of, uh, of diversity of thought. Because I think for sailing to grow, we're gonna have to have that diversity of thought. In my, uh, these, are, these are just titles that I've kind of done. It's, you know, I'm active right now in the Recreational Boating Leadership Council, and what that is is a, uh, it's a consortium of um, marine professionals that have come together a couple years ago to kind of address the issue that, yeah, we're looking at the statistical demographics, and if we keep doing the same thing we're doing, um, yeah, we're going to run out of people to kind of fill boats. Um, and, you know, and I'm just talking about filling them, not too much selling them. Um, I, I'm, I'm a business owner of Carmen Yachts in Chicago. I'm a boat dealer. I, I wasn't always a boat dealer. I, I came to the marine industry from a 17-year career in corporate America. I was in the bio and, uh, biotech and pharmaceutical industry. So I'm a business person, okay? And, and it's a little atypical because um, I, I, the people that I've met, I've met a lot of great people in the sport of sailing, but a lot of people have used sailing to kind of subsidize their habit, you know? And, 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 and so, again, we're thinking inside the box. Um, what I, what I'm, oh, I'm seeing us trying to do right now in sailing is something that we did 25, 30 years ago in corporate America because they figured in order to continue to drive profits, your internal organizations have to look like the customer demographic you're going after. So it's just, it's just, it's common sense. It's a business practice. And it, the, the encouraging part, and, and why I don't want to, you know, focus so much on doom and gloom, is that there's a lot of case studies to learn from in what's already been done. We're not the first to do this, and we won't be the last. Um, and then, you know, the other point, yeah, was, I, you know, I've, I've also had the opportunity to be the, you know, honored to be the, the chairman of the race to Mackinac, and it's a first. Um, uh, regretfully, I, I don't want to be the last. You know, I, I don't want to be the last guy that comes through and, and, and becomes that. Um, in the 21 Mac chairman, uh, 22 Mac chairmans that there have been so far, um, our club has led in the fact that they had their very first female Mac chair in 1993. In, and I am the first in 103 years of the race being around that's Hispanic. So, 
there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> um, and this room gives me hope because I'll tell you what, I look at the faces around here. We got a lot of women in the room. Uh, my friend Joey from Chicago is back here. I mean, Jason, I mean, there, there's hope, guys. I mean, and you look around and I go, to, I go to events. I mean, in Chicago, we've got a coach at Northwestern, African American, and, and you know, and, and I, I talk to him all the time and it's just like, it, it, it gives me hope because the kids, my kids, as they grow up, are not gonna grow up in a world of, of you know, hey, it, it's, you're, we're judged by color and we're judged by gender or, you know, or, or preference or whatever. It, their, their world is completely different and that's, that's comforting. Um, you know, Jason touched into this a little bit, uh, the changing world around us. The statistics are fairly, uh, fairly uh, clear. You know, uh, white, Hispanic, white non-Hispanic births are flat to declining. You know, the African-American birth rate is flat to declining. Um, one out of four kids in kindergarten today, today, is of Hispanic heritage. Dovetailing on Jason's point about the collegiate efforts, 2013 was the first year the largest demographic of college enrollees was Hispanic, okay? So we're making progress. The world is changing. Single women make up 18% of new home buyers versus 10% for men. And I tell you, when we got together industry professionals, we heard the, the, you know, it was a room of 250 people the first time we got together. I was one of two Hispanics in a the room. There were about five Asians and about 15 women in the room. And from the women, the biggest thing that came out was, you know what drives me nuts is I walk into a boat dealership and the guy talks to my husband. And that, that, I mean, imagine that, 50% of the buying decision, sometimes in, in, in most cases, even more than 50%. In my house, it's like 100%, but you know. <laughs> but you know, it, it's just, <laughs> that's kind of how it is. But it, it, again, you know, it's diversity of thought. Um, and, and the other one is American population less than, than 20 years old is 27.3%. So that's almost a third of the population. Now, obviously the baby boomer demographic makes up a large chunk of that, and that's, I mean, that's like 52, uh, to 65, um, but you know, right behind that, we've got a good bumper crop of, uh, of, of, of people coming through. Um, this is an initiative that, that it, it's, it's basic common sense. You know, I've used this in community organizing, I've used it in political organizations. I'm very involved in scouting. That scouting is a pathway that brought me to the water. You know, um, I was a Boy Scout as a kid, and if it wasn't for that, I would never have gone to get my, gone to scout camp to learn how to sail. I, I did it as part of my sailing merit badge. Never thought I was gonna sail ever again, much less be in the industry. Um, but, you know, when I had the opportunity, my career took me to Seattle, um, I started talking to clients and, you know, we got out on the water. Um, then I had the opportunity to move down to Miami and I did, you know, I did a lot of races down there, did a lot of sailing in Miami, did, you know, across the, across the Pacific Ocean. I've done some up and down in, in the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it just, but what came is the invitation, you know, people said, hey, why don't you come out on the boat? Come with me. You like sailing? Come on, let's go. Meet me on Wednesday. That's where it starts. Um, so, you, you know, the question came from, from Maine in the back of the room earlier, to truly seek to understand the community. You gotta start at the base, you know. We're, you know, look at the demographics in your state. Um, I talked to Brad Reed uh, yesterday after one of our sessions, and this bell went off in my head. Um, you know, I was looking at uh, the Rhode Island Marine Trade Association. I know right now we're in, we're in a tough economic state in our country, so it's all about jobs. And, um, you know, Rhode Island's, greater than almost 50%, and I, I'm, I'm off on the numbers, but almost 50% of their GDP for their state comes out of the marine industry. They have, you know, there's 19 Hispanic mayors in the, in the country. One of them happens to be in Providence, Angel Tavares, he's Colombian. So I said to Brad, I said, what if we engaged Mayor Tavares, who happens to be running for governor, by the way, in an outreach initiative that had him talk to the charter schools, he, which he so much advocates in Providence, to have those kids come out and learn about marine, you know, a, a career in the marine trades. Because it starts like there. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of vertical integration. In corporate America, that means that everybody from the guy on the manufacturing floor to your senior management represents the people you're going after. Your world inside looks like the world outside, okay? And to Don's point, does our world in sailing look like that, you know? Does our, do the, do the people on the stage, and, and to Jason's point, that's not bad, but we have to start to change that, you know? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that Chicago Yacht Club has been uh, uh, very open, and they've seen it. I mean, I'm one of probably three Hispanics in the club. The other one happens to be my brother. They've made a lot of firsts, though. They're, they're the first club that had a Hispanic chairman of the, the race to Mackinac. They're also the first club where they had two Hispanic brothers 
chair the two of three of their major events. My brother is chairman of the Birth Cup, which is our other signature event. So I mean, they're taking risk in that. It's calculated because they know our performance um, factors, but it, it, they're taking the chance. They're saying, "Why don't you try it out?" You know, and they're giving us the support that we need to kind of be successful in it. Um, so that's kind of what it takes. But in the outreach effort, it's real simple. You know, you look to understand the community, identify the key stakeholders, you b develop relationships. Um, you secure those relationships, and then you, and then you request for them to participate. And you know, you, we all know examples of where this goes wrong in the political world, because you know, a politician wants to run for office, he's gonna go out and take a lot of opportunity token photographs. He starts at the top of the pyramid, and, and it's fairly thin-skinned, you know, because you see it, and it's, it's, it's fake. It comes across as fake. So that's where I mean that, that vertical integration is important. You know, step away from assumptions, seek to understand the group, you know, inclusion. Um, and, and stay away from the tokenism and the acts of symbolism. Um, I'd like to propose the notion of outreach versus inclusion. Outreach is an action, inclusion is the outcome, okay? So the goal for U.S. sailing should be to include as many people that currently aren't involved in sailing in the sport. To Jason's point, and I've, I, you know, I've had this, I've had uh, the media ask me, you know, because we, we developed the one design class in Chicago. We had the largest one design class in the Beneteau 36.7s. And everybody said, oh, you guys are doing really great for all the, you've sold 38 of these boats in Lake Michigan, you've got a ton of boats on the line. You must be doing awesome. I said, you know, the better part about it, for every one of those race boats we've sold, we've sold five cruising boats. So what does that mean? It can't be all about racing. Cruisers want to get out of the water too. So how do you engage them? How do you engage them? I, our, our colleagues here in, in San Diego, um, Barrett Canfield and Rick Day, they own Southwest Yachts, they did something really dynamic a couple years ago. They started this thing called the Benito Cup. And you can call it whatever cup you want, but it's effectively what they did is they got all the cruisers out and they just they made a fun social event of it because they want to be part of something too. What sailing is is a community. It's community within communities. There's a racing community, there's a cruising community. So you, our job is, is ambassadors of the sport, which is what I'll all deputize you today in this room, ambassadors of the sport, is that, that we continue to build those communities. And those communities might look like you know, the cruising fleet that gets out there and gets people together. They have a, they have a race around the marks. You know, it's like in Chicago, it's real simple. We do this thing called Fun God at the end of the year, my fleet. And we have, you know, we get everybody together. I, we, we talked about this on the plane ride out. Um, we get everybody together. We get all the boats that are going to participate on the dock. It, by position, everybody, everybody puts their name in, in, in a hat. Everybody pull, has to pull out a bow person, a mass person, a main trimmer. You know, in chip trimmer, the only thing that's constant is the owner, the driver, the skipper, okay? And we mix them up on the boats. We're building community. You get to know your neighbors, you know? You, you kind of, that builds free, fleet camaraderie. And then we have a 10 o'clock harbor start. And it's basically everybody has to be out at the, at the, the break wall to the harbor at 10 o'clock. You get out, everybody, you know, depending on the wind, wind direction and all, we head up to one crib. We have these cribs in Chicago for anybody that's not been there. Uh, these water cribs that pump water back onto the mainland. You head around one crib, down to the other crib, back in. First one back into the harbor mouth, it's the winner, okay? Afterwards, we have a big get-together at, at the Yacht Club. Have Bloody Marys, have a good time. People stick around till 7, 8 o'clock at night. You know, it's, 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 it's great. But we've, we've turned that into a fun event, you know? And, and, and we invite people that are cruisers. We invite everybody. Just come out. It doesn't matter if you're not the best at the job that, that, that you have to do. Just come out and try it, you know? Talk about not needing to reinvent the wheel. And, and this is point, pointed because we're in Olympic season right now, but uh, there's a lot of case studies of what we can do. Um, circa 19, 1989, and this is another different thing about me, I grew up playing hockey. So again, I'm a, another you know, point of a percent of a percent. You know? I mean, how many Hispanics do you know that played hockey? There's a lot more today than when I played. Um, circa 1989, the sport of hockey was on life, saving, on life support, despite having the NHL. You know, it, was, it had some of the same misconceptions that, you know, perceptions that, that we do inside the sport of sailing is seen as the sport of the wealthy. It's America's, I, I, and that's probably being generous, fifth tier sport. Um, and there was no diversity pipeline in, in, in the sport at all. You know, and, but again, it's about perceptions. So USA Hockey was very, they were very institutional in getting together and saying, how do we change this dynamic? And they're organized a lot like US Sailing is. Um, you know, I kind of parallel these because for every one of these, there's um, 
there, there's a counterpoint in, in U.S. sailing. You know, they're, 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 it's, the sport of hockey is seen as requiring a high level of skill to participate. You know, same can, hold, can be held true for, for sailing. You know, you're, it's perceived that in hockey, you have to be wealthy to afford the ice time and the equipment, okay? Same can be said for sailing. In the sport of hockey, it occurs in specialized locations, rinks. The same can be said for sailing, sailing centers and, in, and yacht clubs. There's a lack, at one point in hockey, there was a lack of diversity role models. The same can be said in sailing. Um, their outreach campaign kind of look at packaging their marketing so pe people can walk away. And then obviously hockey is like soccer, you know, you, there's a lot of parental involvement. So that's, you know, one difference. I, you know, it's somewhat similar to our, our youth sailing programs. Uh, if the parents are into the sport, um, sometimes that could be a negative or a positive, depending on how you look at it. But, uh, um, you know, they, they came across with a, a, a packaged marketing campaign. And I'm a, I'm a marketer at heart, so this kind of speaks to me as a case study. They really looked soup to nuts to develop a campaign that gave everybody the ability to go out and become an ambassador, to talk, to do what I'm doing here today and talk about sailing in their, you know, PTA groups, their school groups. They took it to the grassroots level. 90, remember, the, remember the rule, 90% of politics is local. It, it was driven at the local level. There were a lot of youth level initiatives there were a lot of girl-centered activities. And what did that lead to? Two Olympic gold medal teams. We've had Olympic gold medalists. Anna Tunnicliff, is, you know, she, she ran around on the, you know, on the circuit kind of, you know, talking to, talking to girls. Um, uh, Dawn talked about uh, Kate, Kate Muller. Uh, on, our, on our sailing team, we have another uh, lady who started sailing, Christina Cordero Chadwick. I think you probably know her, uh, Joe. And Christina started sailing when she was eight. You know, she's of Peruvian descent. My daughters love the heck out of Miss Christina and Miss Kate. She is their, they are their, their role models. So they're basically, they see themselves being her. So you need those role models in the sport to kind of talk to the kids and say, hey, you can do it. I did it, you can do it too. Um, there was that ethnic outreach as well. I mean, Willie O'Ree toured. I mean, I remember working on, with him on projects at Garfield Park. You know, where they basically, Willie came out and we brought a bunch of kids from the west side of Chicago and we did some skating with them. Some of these kids had never been on skates before. It was amazing to see their, the fact that they could glide. Um, and, and kids pick up things a lot faster than us adults do, as we all know. They, they, they established training feeder programs by region. And youth participation, the metrics, the deliverables that they had, they saw their greatest level, of, the explosion of, of, of the sport from 1990 to the year 2000. It was like, I think it was staggering numbers, like 300%. The number of rinks popping up were all over the place. I had to drive from the south side of Chicago way out into the far, far south suburbs as a kid to be able to go to a hockey rink. If I was a kid today, I could go three blocks and find a hockey rink. In the city, mind you. And if I'm in the suburbs, even more. It's, it's, there's, it's, they're more, uh, they're more, uh, more available. So they basically grew their base that way. I mean, and our model is there. I mean, we could grow more community sailing centers. I mean, Joey just started, they, Joey's working with a, a program at, with um, After School Matters. It's, a, it's an in initiative by the mayor. And with the Chicago Park District, they're, they're getting, they're exposing kids to sailing. There's a charter school opening up on the south side of Chicago that's gonna focus on marine trades. Um, up in uh, Brunswick and Johnson Marine, well, they wanted to do it in Illinois, but because our state is in such a state of disarray, they decided to go to Wisconsin, and they formed a charter school in Racine. Not only did they do that, but they are now moving a 300-job facility to that same area. So all those kids that are coming from that charter school are going to have internships in, in, in STEM, in engineering or something. So, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's our goal in the sport of sailing. I mean, we have such a need. I'm, I'm a biochemistry major, by the way, you know, so I'm a science guy. Um, and I, I, I kind of did the, I did the walk off the team in, in, in medical school. I got accepted to Loyola Medical School and decided I didn't want to go through the 10 years. And I said, all right, I'm pulling out. I'm going to go for a career in business. So I'm, science is near and dear to me. I, I went through the, the workshop yesterday. And I was like, God, we need to be doing more of this. Talk about filling a need in our society today. That's where it's at. That's the gold in, in all of this. Um, I mean, that's really where, where sailing can become relevant and lead. Um, in, in a lot of the communities that we live in, because we all know the statistics. I mean, the United States is at the bottom fifth of industrialized nations in science. We don't even, I mean, we're, we're bringing, we're immigrating people from other countries to fill jobs in our own country, in, in, in allied health fields, and, 
and, and you know, and, and in engineering. I mean, my, my wife's, my wife's um, uh, company, they, they bring people from India in to do IT. They house them here to do IT because they can't find enough people from here to do it. It's, a, it's amazing. So it's about changing the dynamic. It starts with each and every one of us. These are some cool pictures because, you know, that, that's just from a leukemia cup. This is uh, one of my daughters is the one in the picture with me in the middle. Um, we have to control, you know, one of the things that came out of the uh, diversity, uh, the Recreational uh, Boating Leadership Council is that we came up with five different initiatives, five different areas of focus. One of the areas is communication and managing our message. We have to do a better job of humanizing the story of how people get to the water. When I led the marketing campaign for the Race to Mackinac, and we put the strategic initiatives together for, for the MAC, um, one of our taglines for that was Pathways to the Water. And we sought within the, within the, the sailing body, the electric, the 3,600, 6,000 sailors that do the race every year, to, to single out people that we knew. It was all about relationships, you know, women, um, you know, people that are multi-generational that have done the sport, African Americans, Hispanics, and we pitched those stories to the media so that they saw that not everybody's wearing an ascot and a blue blazer. People came from different pathways to the water. That this race is about Chicago's history, not so much about a wealthy group of people on the lakefront. You know, the, the rich maritime history that Chicago has. So we have to humanize it. You're seeing a lot of this in the marketing campaigns for the Olympics right now if you turn the TV on. Um, Citibank's doing a great job of it. They're one of the, the Olympic sponsors. You have to tell the story of how those kids got there. How that little girl from the south side of Chicago went all the way to Racine, Wisconsin, or just outside of Milwaukee to learn how to skate. And she's on the Olympic team now. You know? Those are the stories you got to tell because that's the hope you give the kids. Um, we have to control our images. I'm, I'm happy to say the Discover Boating campaign. This photo here is part of a series of photographs that we took. Why? Because all the photography that you see in boats has gray-haired, older people in it. Think about when you pick up a financial services leaflet. They show a, a sailboat with an elderly, retired couple on it. So the illusion that they present is that you have to be old and retired to afford a boat or to participate in sailing. We have to control that dynamic. And we've got to show families on the boat you know, using them. And that's what we sought to do with the, 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 the photo photography campaign that we did with Discover Boating. We, t we went out on a couple of boats for power and sailboats for an afternoon and took photos out on Chicago's lakefront. Um, I'm not the best model, but they used my kids. <laughs> so, um, it, but it was great to just see the kids light up. And, you know, my daughter, you can see this from the smile on her face there. I mean, it's, it's the American dream, kids getting out on the water, you know, doing something they haven't done. Um, the other photographs are from a leukemia cup, and we, we took it upon our team to say, hey, we're going to get all the kids on. And we're just going to do leukemia, but no, it doesn't matter how we finish. But the kids, you can see from the smiles on their face, they're having fun on the boat. We have to have more images of this. I'm thankful that Beneteau, Group Beneteau, has listened to us over the last 10 years of being on their dealer advisory council. Pick up a Beneteau ad. We, for the longest time, told them, you got to show women at the helm. And they have to have their clothes on. <laughs> and you look at the Beneteau ads, and they have women at the helm. The guy's doing the trimming. One of the first things that we did when we bought the dealership over 12 years ago is we brought um, Captain Suzanne Geisman in to talk about, you know, with a lot of our, our, our uh, uh, lady skippers in the group, uh, the, the other halves, the better halves of the, of the sailing uh, couples, and to talk to them about her book. It's just called uh, It's Your Boat Too, you know, about how do they become competent. Because what I observed at first was, you know, women are like, oh, you know, I'm just kind of the crew. No, it's your boat. You're 50% of the household. It's your boat. So learn how to use it, because what happens if he gets knocked on his head or has a heart attack? What are you going to do? Call somebody? You know? So, I mean, it's, it's thinking outside the box and those types of things that, that we have to do. So, I, I, like I said, I, like I started it out, and, and I'll end it. I, I'm, very, um, I'm, I'm very encouraged by um, the part, the, the, this group and what I'm seeing going on in, in Chicago and different cities. Um, you know, it, we're, we're realizing, we're starting to wake up. And I'm not going to say it's too late, because there's a lot of time to do this. There's a lot of, you just got to kind of look for it. You, you got to keep mining the gold. So um, with that, uh, that's kind of the, the gist of my presentation. So.
we'll open it up to questions from anybody. But before I do that, I just wanted to say I took some notes, and I'm super excited about how many people showed up, first of all, because it's always good to have a good audience. Um, but also the, the, the passion at every single level of everything we've been talking about. But some things I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to people on a local level personally, often and again and again. Um, I'm going to try to find somebody and maybe make U.S. Sailing look for a board member that knows very little about sailing. I thought that was spectacular. Um, I am going to uh, reach out and talk to people about collaborating with USA Swimming and their Learn to Sail. If I have a yacht club that has a swimming pool, why the heck not? And if I'm going to reach out to universities not just the elite racing team, but the club. Most college sailing have 100 to 150 kids in their club and seven on the sailing team. So reaching out to that. And um, I can't read the rest of my writing. <laughs> oh, I'm going to make sure that the leadership looks like my target market. So with that, let's open up to questions. people on the board that have silver hair because they're there because they earned it as long as the pipeline's there. Well, and it's clear that you and, and Lou are doing great things for outreach. Um, and and I, I sort of wonder about a pet peeve of mine. When I was in Charleston, and we've got Jess here from Charleston Community Sailing, and there's a great community sailing program. When I was in Charleston, I learned that two of the three yacht clubs, I think, don't allow single women to join. And this is actually really common in this country and something people don't talk about. USM doesn't seem to have a problem with it because they accredit them as, as, as yacht club. But they don't actually allow single women to join. It blew my head off. Um, so do we just go around them and just say the community sailing is where it's at? Or can they be pressured by the body the way that the government had to in America in order to get rights available to everyone? Okay, so the first thing is that US sailing does have a code and it is written in the regulations that you shall not um, discriminate, and that includes race, sex, and, and, and uh, choice. I understand there's a lot of tradition, and you can imagine that I've seen that throughout the years. When I was 16, I was a member of North Star Sail Club in Bayview, which we've established does have the best bar, not only would not allow women members, they would not allow women to use their reciprocal privileges, but a guy who was exactly the same at North Star could use reciprocal privileges. Now when you're 15 and people are buying you a drink, let's not even talk about that, but you don't have to spend your money. So the point is that we've had change, but it's up to us to push it hard. And if you have those um, people or those clubs, I think it, it takes a while. And it just takes conscious effort and it can be strong from the men. Let me tell you who I think are the strongest advocates for gender equality, fathers of daughters because they did not realize that there, were, there was a discrimination until it was their daughter. So anybody who's a father of a daughter, stand up and fight, and you're gonna be super effective, and women are always just gonna keep fighting. Don't give up. Yeah. 
I think the executive director, Jack, did you hear that? <laughs> okay, I think, I think it might be done. Exactly about that. Um, community, class, and yacht club collaboration. So, you know, just like the structure, I've been at this for a lot of years. I see all different levels, and it depends what's important for you. And whoever said about location, that is super critical. You don't like you, know, you don't need to go a four-hour drive, like Jason said, to find somebody. So, what works for you? There are high school sailing programs that are starting up. Keep it simple when you start. If there is a community sailing program, Brad Reed's gonna be speaking today. They put together Sail Newport and the New York Yacht Club. I mean, the New York Yacht Club to, to, with the community sailing. 15 years ago, that would have been like, are you crazy? You're from outer space. But they've made it work. So it's what works for them. And why does that work? They're local, they're close to each other, they have access, they can have a lot of activity at the community sailing center, they can still have dinners at the yacht club, they can have the awards parties there, so that, that, you, know, you, you don't try to duplicate. For instance, at Oak Cliff, 
which is the only one of its kind in the world, we looked around and our first thing said, we are not a yacht club, we are not a community sailing center. Because there is the Waterfront Center, which is spectacular. There's Sawanica, which is the nice yacht, you know, the nice rich yacht club. There's Sagamore, which is the every man's yacht club. And we don't want to duplicate, we want to fit in between. So don't try to duplicate, try to collaborate.
belong to Edgewater Yacht Club, which, you know, right next to us is a very large um, gay community. And we have some members that um, are in part of that community, but the way we were able to bring in more members is they came up with a domestic partner uh, membership. Through that, um, Edgewater is actually going to host the sealing event or portion of the gay games this yeah. summer. So, yeah. the team trained in Oak Cliff to go there, so yeah. watch out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're actually um, wrapping up here. I, just, I personally want to thank both of you guys. You had such huge. Everybody, you guys are fighting the fight, so go out and keep up the good work. Thank you.